So just do a little introduction before we dive in. Uh, Should I well, start recording on my side now? Sure, Are you, you can. Okay. All I'm right. Recording as well. Rock and roll. And this will live in the Tilt Together group as well for people um, to come back and uh, who missed this. So first of all, just welcome to this Facebook Live. Seth and I uh, talk pretty regularly and we just felt we were noticing a lot of just energy around uh, the summer, the looming summer. Uh, and then even beyond that, like there's a lot of conversation about what that's going to look like. And we said, let's just jump on a Facebook Live to answer questions and kind of see what's going on with people. So, and if there's any way that we can support you. So I'm going to introduce myself and Seth for people who are new to either of us. I know we had a lot of people just join the group. Um, and while I'm doing that, for the viewers, if you want to, uh, in the chat on Facebook, if you have a question, I'm going to try to monitor that as well. Okay. So uh, my name is Debbie Reber. I'm the founder of Tilt Parenting. I run the Tilt Parenting podcast. I'm the author of a book called Differently Wired, Raising an Exceptional Child in a Conventional World. And Differently Wired is the terminology that I love to use for kids who are in any way neurologically atypical. And yeah, that's me. And Tilt Together, uh, if you're new to this group, this is really just a community for parents who really share Tilt's philosophy of optimism and positivity and not looking at our kids like they're broken or need to be fixed, but rather how can we really see who they are and support them in being the best they can be while supporting ourselves as parents. And Seth, would you like me to introduce you or would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll do it okay. and then you can fill in the blanks. Okay. Um, my name is Seth Perler. I'm an executive function coach and, um, I have a site called SethPerler.com where I put out content every week for parents and teachers who have students who struggle with executive function, which is getting things done. So a lot of our differently wired students, um, struggle with homework and grades and using planners and getting organized and time management and stress and anxiety and overwhelm and all of these sorts of things. So I specialize in helping kids that struggle with these types of things. And Debbie and I have done a lot of uh, very aligned work, whether we're working together or not, we're just on the same page where the bottom line is, what do kids need? How do we help families get their kids what they need? So hi, everybody. Yeah, Seth is my go-to for all things executive functioning. And also we've become kind of partners in crime because we both feel so passionate about serving this community. And we also um, are never short of ideas and we can create a lot of more work for ourselves pretty quickly, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so anyway, thanks for doing this. And um, let's just jump in because it's Friday. It's Friday night. I know we all have big plans, restaurants, clubs. We got a, that's not happening. Um, but uh, I actually, there's already a question on here that I think we should just dive right in. Let's do it. Really good one um, and relevant, I think, to many of us. How do I keep my son? Oh, social? Debbie. Um, yeah. Also, everybody out there, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Feel free to tell us who you are, how old your child is, where you're located, any relevant information to get the community to understand you are not alone. You're not the only one here. There's so many people going through the same sorts of things, but um, we'll be looking at the questions. So just want to reiterate, feel free to add any question with as much detail or um, as short or long as you want. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that, Seth. So um, the question is, how do I keep my son social? He struggles socially uh, over the summer if everyone is still social distancing. Um, and that is something I know is a concern for many of us. And uh, I, in fact, I just made a plan to see a person, a friend of mine here who has a teenage son that, that my son Asher, the 15 year old son knows well, and it'll be the first teen friend he's seen in three months in real life. And I'm, wow, I'm so excited for what that's going to look like. Um, but, you know, I think, I think thinking about just the idea of um, social, um, 
what a social life looks like or social learning is looking really different right now. And if there are ways, I know that a lot of camps are actually going online. There's so many more opportunities happening. In fact, there's a camp that we are looking at that we wouldn't have gone to if it was live, but now they're moving online and there's a lot more capacity for people. Um, and, and I was interested in it specifically because they're going to be doing really small work groups within this camp. And I thought, well, at least he'll communicate with uh, the same group of kids uh, every day for a couple of weeks. So um, I think we can get creative and, and also just even redefining what being social looks like. I think we have to do that. I know many of us are worried about this time right now. Um, because it does look so different, especially if we have kids with those lagging skills. But, um, you know, as much as you can do with Zoom, if you can do those kind of one-to-one uh, -one even, you know, meet at a park or go on a hike together and, and kind of keep your distance, have your masks on, how, how, that's how we're gonna do it tomorrow. We're actually going to a cemetery for our social distancing walk. We're going to a big cemetery here in Brooklyn, which is, a big green space and we need greenery. But um, so those are the, some of the things I'm doing. And, and even just thinking this could be an opportunity for kids who struggle with social thinking to more safely explore relationships too, because it could be on a smaller level. So I think with some reframing, there's, a, there's also a lot of opportunity here. What do you think, Seth? Um, I'm taking notes. <laughs> so that I can keep track of my thoughts. So um, I, I guess when, I, when I'm thinking about social and uh, what's going on right now, I think the, the first thing for me is, um, is going to be safety uh, above all. But I think getting the facts, and I know that everybody has different interpretations of the facts, but getting the facts right for your family in terms of what it means to be safe and discussing that openly before the situation I think is important. Maybe even making something, I'm very big on visual stuff, but maybe make a list of the top three to 10 um, important things that you all value as your family and put them on the fridge in terms of the safety measures. Like, do you have to wear a mask when you're in a car, if you're with your family? Probably not. Um, unless somebody's infected, obviously that's a completely different story unless there's an infection. But um, like when I'm on trails, I put it on whenever I'm passing people, but I don't wear it when I'm not near people because there's not tons of people. Anyhow, understanding the facts and getting clear on that, but having the discussion before, because I've seen so many te teenagers around town here that are completely on top of each other. They're right up in each other's faces. They, they're just... Um, if they, if there does happen to be carriers there, that is uh, scary for people who would be at risk. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing that I have is the nervous system and boundaries. And when you, for me, I know as I'm going through this, I, I'm a pretty attuned to my nervous system, but I can tell that I'm lacking social connection. I'm craving it. Um, so I'm sort of playing this game between that I'm craving it, but also I'm resilient and I can handle it and I can be safe when I'm in situations where I'm semi close to people, et cetera. But I think learning your kid's nervous system, this is a very, very big opportunity to notice their body language. In fact, as I'm talking here right now, I notice that my eyebrows are raised. Why? Because the way I'm communicating, that's sort of a softness in terms of my communication. Like I don't think about this stuff 24 seven, but I was just aware that I did that. So looking at their body language, their shoulders, their necks, where they're constricting, where they're stressed. Uh, this is a really good time because we are all on red alert or on some kind of alert right now and um, helping them get in touch with that. We are not very good at that as a culture, but it is so important for us to understand how our body is communicating with us about what's going on um, so that we can make uh, more rational decisions about how to respond to situations. Uh, I think this also, the nervous system has a lot to do with boundaries. So really watching your child's boundaries. We're all in each other's space as families and stuff right now. But again, when they start meeting with other kids, it's a really good opportunity for them to be aware of what their boundaries are, what's going on with their nervous system. Watch them when they're with their friends. Um, so 
The next thing I have is um, resilience. Uh, this is a really hard time, but we don't need much as humans. Like we're used to the world that we live in, but um, as these sort of uh, mammals on earth, we really can live a very simple life very well. And to me, the quality of life comes from the quality of relationships primarily. That's the most important thing. So um, really knowing that your kid is resilient, they are adapting to this stuff and just as they're going in these social situations, um, they're, they're going to be okay. They don't need to have a million friends around them and they can ease into it. Kind of like Debbie was saying. Um, I think this is also a really good time for kids who do struggle with some of the social stuff to have the conversations about discussing how to be friends. What is a friend, how to watch other people's language. So how they can watch their friend's body language and learn from them what they're trying to communicate. Uh, obviously I talk about that a lot and also to model for our kids how to be in relationship with other people, how to connect, how to give body language, how to give eye contact, how to have a two-way conversation, how to really hear someone, how to hold space. This is a really good opportunity to have those experiences through modeling it and also through discussing it. And I have two other things. One, ask them what their ideas are about what they want and about how we should be social and about what a rich, meaningful, powerful, amazing social life looks for. If you have an introvert or you have an extrovert, that's going to look very differently. So really being curious about who your child is and asking them what, do, what does a great social life look like for them. And you can very intentionally ease back into some of these things with a lot more mindfulness about it so that your kids, again, are making better decisions uh, in terms of the people they want in their life and how they want to show up. And then the last thing that I have is that it's okay to be messy. It's still okay that they have conflict with their friends, that they have conflict with you, with their themselves. It's okay to be messy. It's what do we do with these things? Do we use the, the messiness as an opportunity to grow or do we use it for shame and, and trying to um, tell people how they should be? Um, we can really use it as an opportunity to grow. Um, and beware, being aware of when your kid is having a messy situation with a, another child or teenager or whatever, being aware of, are, are you rescuing or supporting? Are you enabling or helping? And just sort of questioning yourself and looking for that sort of stuff. That's, those are the thoughts that popped into my head, Debbie. Those are some good thoughts. Um, I wanted to add something. As you were talking, uh, I was thinking about the fact that there are a lot of schools and uh, camps who are trying to move their offerings, uh, including social opportunities online. And a lot of our kids are just not interested, right? Um, because it just, you know, maybe they weren't interested when it was live. Like I'm thinking of some schools have after school clubs, right? I know that some schools are offering those now over Zoom and, and our kids may be like, no, not interested. And, and so I just wanted to introduce the phrase, I've been thinking about this a lot, the phrase, would you be willing to, as opposed to, I think you should try this, why don't you, you know, uh, this is something I got from Zachary Morris, those of you who listen to my show, he's been on many times, he's really being into nonviolent communication and respectful communication with our kids. And there's something about that language of, would you be willing to try this? That helps the child feel like they're in control. It can be on their terms. And it also just opens them up in a way. And I think if there are social opportunities, you know, our child might even want, like crave the social connectedness, but there's some aspect about the way it's being offered that they are resistant to. Um, and, and they may not know why, and they might not be able to express that. And so how, you know, not challenging them, but saying, you know, this is a social opportunity. I know that you're craving time with friends. You might be missing time with friends. And so this exists. Would you be willing to just try it once and we'll see how it goes? You don't even have to stay on the whole time. Like, you know, just kind of ease back, but also get them to kind of think, well, I don't know, would I be willing to do that? And there's something about that phrasing that opens kids up. So that might be something to try as well. 
And along those lines, that that is an amazing thing because so much of the, their resistance has to do with overwhelm of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we want to make these things that we know might be in their best interest. It might be a good challenge for them. They might actually like it, yada, yada. We want to make it an easy yes. And the way that we do it is we chunk it down into very bite-sized manageable risks. So would you be willing to try it for, and then I like what's called a false choice. Would you be willing to check it out for five, 10 or 15 minutes? And that frames it in a way where they're not thinking an hour. If they, and, and I do tell my kids when I do things like this with my students for math or writing or this or that, if you are absolutely, if you absolutely hate this after five minutes, we're done. I promise I give you my word. We're done. I'm not going to push you, you know? So anyhow, I just think that was a, uh, mm -hmm. yeah for sure yep because then what do you have to lose really right it's where and you know you have a lot to gain if it works um i wanted to pivot to something else again i'm just monitoring the the um comments over here uh no new questions so if you do have anything that you want seth and i to touch upon in the next 30 minutes what can be about what's happening right now it can be about summer, summer or, fall. or fall anything just put it in there um, I did want to touch upon something too. I've been thinking a lot about, so a lot of our kids are rolling off of school right now. Some of them are already done. I know some of them, you know, maybe have a week or two to go. And then, you know, we, and then we have summer that's going to look different probably than the summer we were envisioning. Um, because our kids have been home and doing whatever school looks like from their room or whatever, maybe not changing out of pajamas. Maybe it's looked already like summer vacation, even though they were really, uh, some of them were attending to Zoom classes. I think it's important to give them a break to recognize that we don't need to fill their schedule as soon as they're done with school with something else. Um, that even though they've been home and we might think that they can't have a week or two of complete unstructure that some of them still really need that. You know, they just the, think about what it was like when you were done with school and you just needed to, like, oh my gosh, I need to sleep in. I need to, you know, be lazy for a while. Maybe that's more the status quo for some of our kids, but still, I think it's okay to acknowledge and important to acknowledge that they may need a break, even if it's just a week of, of a true detox from everything to help them kind of reset and get back to a baseline before we start thinking that we need to fill their time with activities or online things that we find. Just something I've been thinking about. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think that, again, as far as the nervous system is concerned, like a lot of us are, I mean, all of us are really overwhelmed with what's going on in the world right now. And this is a really challenging time. So yeah, to take time. I think that one thing is, is that oftentimes our kids know what they need. They may not be able to articulate it, but they may know what they need better than we do. So we may think, oh, well, my kid needs to wake up at 9 a.m. They need to do this and that. You know, they may, especially if they're teenagers, need to sleep till 1 p.m. every day. And I'm not saying that they should be up till 3 a.m. on electronics. That's not at all what I'm saying. But they need a lot of rest. Uh, this is a traumatic time. Um, they need a lot of processing uh, and and spaciousness. Now, it sh it, I, am I concerned about kids who are like completely obsessed with electronics and screen time? And stuff? Sure, absolutely. So take what I'm saying uh, with that stuff in consideration. But they know when they need to rest and they need to do a lot of the things. Like they may really need to heal a lot from and and process a lot in their own minds in their own ways. Uh, what's going on. Can you imagine growing up during this time? Um, it's a lot to process and make sense of. So yeah, I think that they really can take a big break. Um, mm -hmm. Will they need some sort of a schedule? Yes. But uh, at, for now, I do think people need to decompress. Yeah. And that is a really nice lead into a question that we got in the chat, which I'm going to read. Um, it's, the question is, we've registered my 12-year-old daughter for, for some virtual camps, and I'm hoping to set up a positive schedule or plan for the summer. Distance learning has been hard. She's finishing sixth grade in the next two weeks, and I would love for summer to feel different than the pressure of school. 
She's very bright and creative, but struggles with executive functioning and schedules, time management. And in such an anxious and strange time, just keeping things going has been hard. It all feels so overwhelming. I would love any tips on positive structure or support. Um, I'm curious to know, that's a great question. I'm curious to know about what the schedule is for these virtual camps. Um, you know, I'll say from my, my homeschooling days, you know, I homeschooled for six years and the key to that was, you know, it's probably a lot of what I'm going to be leaning into this summer was collaboration, like designing it together. Um, you know, asking, you know, asking your daughter, what are, what would you like the summer to feel like? Um, what would you hope what are, you know, three things you'd like to do this summer that we can do in this time? Um, how could we structure our day so that it would give you kind of what you need? And maybe that's like a day of, you know, of nothing on the schedule once a week. Um, maybe it's lazy days. Maybe it's baking days, maybe, you know, building in different things. Maybe it's themed weeks. Um, when, when my son was that age, we also kind of said, let's, you know, this week, let's, let's pick out recipes and we'll bake every day this week. And this week, let's, and we would just come up with different themes, nature week, and we'd go to a different park every day. Um, so just designing it together. And, and I guess, you know, that's why I'd love to know about the classes or the, the camps that you're signing up is um, being mindful not to over schedule. I think, that's something a lot of us feel like we need to do is like fill their time and um, making sure that they, they do have the time to de to decompress, whether that's breaks in between camps or just afternoon or, or whatever that's going to look like. And also I'll just say one more thing. And then Seth, you jump in is just, and I've been saying this, this throughout this whole time is always prioritizing mental and emotional well being. So if you're noticing that your daughter is, becoming anxious or that she's not getting the time to really kind of stay regulated and come to a more calm place, then back off a little bit, take some things away, like using this summer to give her a chance to really like get back to a uh, more of a baseline. And um, so that she can start whatever happens in the fall, she can feel like she's, um, filled up as opposed to already kind of um, at a more heightened uh, anxious state. What do you want to add to that, Seth? Awesome. Yeah. Something that you said recently um, when we were talking about something <laughs> somewhere sometime, uh, but you said less is more. And a lot of times less is more. And I know that some of you listening have those kids that are just addicted to screen time 24 seven and then get a little sleep. And you, again, I'm not discounting that you need to take that stuff seriously, but when it comes to trying to cram the schedules with a million things, the less is more, you know, a lot of times we are so, we're in a world that measures math, science, social studies, reading, writing, we measure these certain things that we have chosen as the metrics that we value. Those are not the only metrics that we value. Those are just the ones that we measure. So they're in our face all the time. But, um, you know, in, in terms of, let's say, the executive function thing, you know, you might have a day that seems like a really lazy day, but that executive function wise, that may be a day where the child is really regulating emotion and is really um, soothing themselves in a, in a very good way. And, and that may not look like much and there's nothing produced from that. And it doesn't look like they've done any work, but they maybe uh, healing their nervous systems and um, processing thoughts and emotions and having gentle comfort, you know, so just be aware that not everything, is, we're in such a culture that's so used to measuring everything and thinking that that means there's value. There are so many other things. I will mention those in a moment. I think when it comes to the scheduling, the number one word that popped in my mind was visual, 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 visual. Make it visual, make it big, put it on the wall. Um, as Debbie said, uh, involve your child. I use the words buy-in and ownership a lot. We both mean the exact same thing. Get your child's 
buy-in and ownership in terms of what the schedule is. Don't just say, okay, we've dictated it. Now I know some of you are thinking, well, my kid that won't sit down with me to do that. Well, that's a different situation too. Take everything with a grain of salt. But in an ideal world, you do want to get buy-in and ownership and ask them, how do you want to schedule this? What's important to you? Now, you're allowed to have your boundaries too as a parent, and that goes to this next thing. What are your boundaries? What are your firm yeses and your firm noes as a family, as a couple, if you're in a household with two parents, what, uh, and if you're a single parent, what are your firm yeses and firm no's, your boundaries as to what needs to be happening in the house as far as whatever, bedtime, mealtime, uh, connection time, whatever. Um, next thing, this is similar to the visual, is timers, timers, timers. Timers are auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. So use the timers a lot. It makes things more concrete. These kids, a lot of them that struggle with executive function stuff, they're so abstract and more abstraction. For some kids, a lot of abstraction can be great. And there are times when abstraction can be great. But when it comes to scheduling and, and predictability, these kids need some concreteness and the timers can help things be very concrete. Also, when you're making your schedules to make them replicable. So the visual schedules, you can use uh, fluorescent note cards, you can use photographs, you can print up words from the printer, you can write them. But if you can make things on popsicle sticks or note cards or magnets or things that are replicable where you can, your child can have some ownership and buy in in terms of choosing the things that they do during the day. And there are lots of replicable things that they're going to do. Now I'm going to get to what some of those are. When you're thinking about what's important for your child's well-being in terms of um, everything, you might want to think about on those popsicle sticks or note cards or schedules or whatever, the replicable, some of the replicable things that you might want to be considering are when is your child going to have movement and fitness? What about sleep, nutrition? What about connection time, real connection time with the family? with other family members? What about laughter, playfulness, freedom, creativity time, unstructured times? Um, what about time to hold space for them, to really attune to them, to really say, again, who are you? I'm curious about who my child is and spending the time. So anyhow, what sorts of things do you want in your schedule? Um, and then you might have academics in there, reading time, writing time, math time. Um, and I'll I'm going to skip that now. Um, and then finally, one thing that I say about planners and planning and calendars is it's really important to make the plan. It's not nearly as important to keep it. So it's okay if it doesn't go the way you intended it to go. What's important is that it's visual, it's made, the intention is there, but um, you can have a get out of jail free card or multiple get out of jail free, free cards. You might do three a week, three a day. It depends on your kid and your dynamics, but Think outside the box, let go of, of the attachment to it. If your kid struggles with executive function, structure is good for them, but it can be hard for them. So remember, these are skills that are being built. Great answer. I wish I had, had my uh, old schedule to show you. When I was homeschooling, I made this big foam core schedule and I had, I, and I put Velcro and every day was broken down into different periods. Um, and he could do a double period, but there he could just like every morning, he would just look, look at this big pile of cars to choose from. Well, I think I want to listen to a podcast today. I'll go for a walk in the park with you. I'll do a little bit of math. I'm going to read some of this book. I'm going to whatever. And he would just, and then he could put it in the order, but it was Velcro. So he could change it around or if he got really into a project he would do that. But then he also had like a mental health break. That was a special card. He could turn it in. He was allowed to use that. You know, that meant all bets are off. You can just go get in pajamas and do whatever you want to do. He had a couple of those to cash in. So you can be playful in doing this. And it really does help our kids learn those skills and feel a sense of uh, control and our autonomy about their day. I want to touch upon um, two things. Uh, one is gaming, which we could do. That's just a whole conversation, but we should mention it. Uh, and, and the other is exercise that one of the questions we got was, um, what suggestions do you have for resistance to exercise, especially when you know your child gets regulated through exercise? Uh, it's a catch 22 that I'm familiar with. 
Um, I'd like to hear your suggestion, Seth. I'll say that, that um, for us, uh, you know, we've tried different things over the, over the years and sometimes exercise would just be a walk, you know, like walking is how we clear our head. And, and anytime I was able to get him out for a walk with me, I would try to help him touch base with like himself afterwards. Like, how do you feel? Or do you feel mm-hmm. clear now? And so I always kind of use those so that over time, the goal being, he would start to make that connection. Oh, I feel better after I get outside and um, we've slowly built in when we started this call, uh, Asia was playing in the background because right now Asher and my husband are working out, they're doing circuit training to all 80s music twice a day and it's, or twice a week, not twice a day, twice a week. Um, And that's been really cool to see, but this is all new territory for us. So um, so building it in and um, trying to help your child make the connection. So over time, they'll have more buy-in. Do you have thoughts about exercise, Seth? I mean, I don't have great suggestions. Again, it comes down, it's, it's complicated. If you have a very resistant kid, it, it depends on the family and the d- dynamic again. But if you have a kid who's very resistant to it and you're looking at them and you're like, I know that in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you are going to regret this and you have got to move your body. And the the, um, the research on how, how much better the brain functions with exercise is everywhere. So um, the key is, is buying an ownership. And if the dynamic with your child is that they don't want to hear anything you ever have to say anyway, which is a lot of teenagers, you you as the parents don't know anything, um, so that that's so common, but that, that's still where you're starting is buying an ownership. So um, how can we creatively get buying an ownership in this this exercise situation in particular in this case? Well, uh, buying an ownership, the first thing is if there is something that they like to do. So uh, I like hiking. I like rock climbing. Um, I don't like baseball or football or whatever. So they're the things that they like to do. It doesn't have to be going to the gym. There weren't gyms a hundred years ago and beyond in the whole history of mankind and people were very healthy because they were moving. So there are lots of ways for them to do what they like to do. Mm -hmm. Now I know some of you watching, they're like, well, my kid doesn't like to do anything. They just want to be on Minecraft all day long. Yes, that's, you have to contend with that. So another thing is if they don't want to listen to you is don't have them listen to you. Watch YouTube videos with them. Have them listen to podcasts about fitness and exercise from people who are fun and interesting and weird and and people who are entertaining, you know, to listen to. Um, Have people who they will listen to, family members, um, friends of the family, people who are into that stuff. You get yourself out of the conversation, out of the room, off the phone, off the Skype call, walk away, talk to that person before your kid gets on them and sabotage your kid by having the person know that they you want them to talk in a fun way about fitness and exercise. But you got to get buy-in and ownership. If you can't get it, use other methods to get it. Be creative. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the, I guess the last thing that comes to mind is when I'm working with my students and we're working on something, let's say planners that they just hate. Um, I'm not in a lot of parents want to really get into the logic and being rational and being like, you're going to feel so much better. Let me lecture you and blah, blah. They know, they know that they've heard you say it a million times. It's not landing. Okay. So I'm in my case, I'm not trying to convince my students. Oh yeah. Your life's going to be so much better with a planner. I might do that once or twice, but it's really about, I don't, I don't really care what you think right now. Let's walk through the motions. And again, what I said before, it has to be chunked down. So I might say, would you be willing to walk the dog with me for five minutes. If you have a dog, Uh, would you be willing to go for a walk with me at sunset tonight for five minutes after dinner? Would you be willing to um, do a five minute workout uh, video or five minute, a seven minute workout app or whatever? So it's gotta be, it's gotta be an easy yes. And you build from there. Parents are like, well, I know they need X, Y, and Z, but the fact is we have to back way up. And then you can start moving forward once there's a little bit of buy-in, then it's easier to start ramping things up. And it takes a lot of patience and persistence. So those are my thoughts on that. And if you, thank you, great thoughts. Um, And if you have a child too, who is 
more tuned into to you. I don't know if this is happening in your families, but we're all, I mean, we're, we're sharing a pretty small space here. Yeah. So we're all pretty tuned into each other's moods and energies. And sometimes saying, oh my God, I really need a walk. Would you go with me? I need to clear my head. I've got a headache. I've been in front of the computer all day. I need some fresh air. I don't want to go alone. Would you go? Um, sometimes that's a way to get buy-in is if our kids think that they're helping us, we really need to clear our head. So just if you have a child who's more tuned in, um, to us. I know not all of our kids are, uh, but, but that can be a good way too. And as someone suggested, there's a great conversation going on in the chat. So thanks you guys for sharing suggestions. Um, that's awesome. And someone had said that they created uh, an obstacle, creating an obstacle course and then competing against their kids is awesome. So if you have a child who is competitive, that can be, uh, that has not ever worked for us, but I know it's a button for a lot of kids to get them going. Um, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about screen time. Again, whole other conversation. I know this is something so many, I have a friend, Devorah Heitner, who some of you may have heard, I had her on the podcast uh, a while ago. Um, she's actually doing a, a webinar in this masterclass series thing I'm doing just about screen time, because I know right now she's like, everyone wants to talk with her because this is the thing. Our kids are home. What else are they supposed to be doing? And their classes are online and their social lives online. Um, this is tricky. And uh, I know it's especially tricky for our kids who can be hyper-focused and can, you know, can really be drawn to technology. And that's the case. And in, in, I mean, both my guys, my husband and my son are very game oriented. Um, I, what I would say is just think about what those guidelines can be. Uh, I'm not, I gave up having hard and fast rules and, and using, um, you know, uh, strict three hours a day. And, you know, um, I did that for a long time and on our family, it just created way too much conflict. But what we instead did was start creating guidelines together for, for how screens can be a part of our life that can create less conflict. And so we just, this happened over the course of many family meetings, but just talking and noticing the toll that screen time conflict was taking on our family, on our relationship, and knowing that none of us wanted that. And so we just kept working on guidelines, guidelines like as you know, a guideline is after dinner, you know, we don't do screens or um, a guideline is that we have to take our, you know, do X, Y, and Z before this happens, as opposed to very strict, you know, you've got to do this to earn two hours of screen time. And as soon as that time's up, you have to do that, you know, that kind of rigidity really hurt our family. So it's, it's evolving and it always is, but it's been very collaborative. And, and that has really helped us at least have a healthier relationship around the screen dynamic in our family. What thoughts do you have, Seth? Awesome. Well, one thing I want to say is if particularly if you have younger kids and that sort of rigidity does work in your family, go with it as long as you can. So <laughs> yeah. if it does work in your family yeah. in your, uh, cause I do have families where the dynamic is, is that the kid just accepts this is how, even teenagers, whether they yeah. just accept, yep. At, you know, 7 PM, the whole family's done and I don't get my phone until, you know, after I've uh, eaten breakfast and, and gotten ready for school or whatever it is. So I just want to say that now I am very much probably more along the lines of Debbie stylistically in terms of being very um, um, loose with the guidelines and stuff in my style. But but I I just do want to empower you if if it's working <laughs> and you have the dynamic, do it. Um, again, the buying and ownership is key. If you are in a sort of dynamic where you know that there's no buy-in and no ownership, you always have conflict and stuff like that. Well, the issue is 
honestly more about the relationship, the securely attached relating, and you have to back way up to that. Like there's a lot of repair that needs to be done and there's no shame for you. There's no blame. I'm, you know, we all have stuff in our families. We've all grown up with certain dynamics in our families. We don't have instruction books. If you are a couple and there's two of you, you're probably both difficult to each other because we are all difficult. I'm difficult. Debbie's difficult. You know, we don't <laughs> see each other that much. We don't expect Experience that as you know, she's in New York, I'm in Colorado, we have, but we, I guarantee you, tell me if I'm wrong, Debbie, but we are just all difficult people. And that's yeah. okay. And when we can be like, okay, that's fine. We are human beings, we're complicated, there's no instruction book. Then it's like, how do we do some of the repair that needs to happen? Where do we start? So sometimes you have to back way up. So if you're trying to get buy-in and ownership and you're not even there because there, there's been a breakdown, that's okay. Just know where you're starting and start there. So I wanted to say that mm -hmm. when you do are setting your boundaries or your guidelines, um, again, you want to get the buy-in and ownership and sit down and honor the conversation. Don't rush it. This isn't just a, I'm dictating what you need to do thing. It's what I love how Debbie phrased it. You know, what do you think? How, how, how is this impacting the family? And really listening to everybody and really holding space for those sorts of conversations. And in holding space for those conversations, probably not having the phone on right next to you and checking texts during conversations and stuff like that. Um, so that brings me to the next thing, which is modeling it. If we expect our kid, you know, there's the do as I say, not as I do. Well, that's complete BS. That's not reality. Kids watch what we do. And so um, just lost my train of thought on that one, but maybe you feel modeling like, you were talking about modeling. It. Thank you. Yeah. So modeling what, what we expect and being reasonable about that. Then, um, you know, if you have blocks for technology on things, kids know how to get around all your blocks and whether or not, you know, it, I'd bet you money that if you're like, Oh yeah, we have these protections in place. I'll bet you money that your kid knows how to get around them. So, um, you know, again, that comes back to the ownership and buy-in. If you are using blockers of some sort, um, having them be a part of it and choosing how they work and stuff, not having them be a part of it and setting up the passwords and stuff. But um, I do have families that just unplug the internet at certain time, at 10 o'clock every night or whatever, you know, and for some families that can work. Um, I think also what, you know, I keep saying this, but building in connection time without technology, game time, movie time, um, play time, outdoor time, just talking time, reading time, whatever it is that you can do uh, to connect. I mean, these years go by so fast. So connect, connect, connect. I love, love the idea of tech Sabbaths. So occasionally I'll take a day where I don't have anything. Every night I do a tech sundown. I have an alarm on my um, my device that will say it's 930. It is tech sundown time. And so for me, I completely shut everything down. I just have found that for me, I don't even like the temptation of having them on because I know my brain. So I do a complete tech sundown. I love that idea of the tech Sabbath. It can be a day, it can be a night when you guys are doing an activity just for that period of time, whatever. But the tech Sabbaths or tech sundowns. Um, and then um, I, I, I'm, I may be old fashioned in this way, but for me, even when I'm eating dinner with friends nowadays, I turn off my phone when I'm eating dinner with friends and I really want to be present with people. So um, meals without tech where we can connect and slow down, uh, I think are pretty powerful. That's all I got. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask you a follow-up question because you talk a lot about buy-in and ownership. And, you know, I obviously believe that's really important too. And for those who are watching this, who have kids who are younger might be thinking, oh, well, that, you know, this is more something that for teenagers or, or, you know, older kids. Um, but, you know, my thinking is it's it's never too young to start having these conversations to start collaborating. Do you feel the same way? Absolutely, positively, 100%. I think one of the biggest problems that we're seeing in education is that younger kids are easy to lead. So if you say, okay, guys, it's math time, it's science time, it's 
recess time, they're a lot easier to re to lead. But then once they start getting more independence, we don't really give them more independence. We still continue telling them, you need to be at this class at this time, whether or not you like the teacher, whether or not you like the content, you, you, you really don't have a lot of choices. This is, you know, and we don't need to do things that way. Um, but we have a story where we think, oh yeah, we need to dictate all this stuff. But yes, the earlier, the better. You, and, and the earlier you start giving kids choices and you ask them to be a part of it and you can even do the false choices that I talk about, but the earlier that you get them to be a part of it and you really hold space and listen. So part of attachment theory, secure attachment, I'm not gonna get into this whole thing, but basically you have secure and insecure relationships. In a secure relationship, imagine your best friend, uh, someone who you're very close to, you feel like you are secure with them because you feel like they hear you. They've got your back. They listen to you. They understand you. They get you. You feel like they get you. They see you. They know who you are. That is secure. Okay. And we don't always have a lot of secure people in our life, but that's what we want to be doing with them too, is really hear them and say, well, what do you think? And really listen and not try to teach them all the time and logic them all the time and use and give them their, our wisdom all the time. We can actually let them think. We can actually let them make mistakes in their choices in safe ways. So often what happens is that a kid will make a mistake and they'll come back and they'll say, actually, I think this would be a better idea. And what we've just done is empowered them to trust their own thinking. Mm -hmm. And so often we try to rescue them and save them and don't al allow space for that. So does that answer? Yeah, no, that's great. And the two things that just came up for me as you were saying that one is that um, one of the things that that uh, Ned Johnson and Bill Stixrude say in their uh, book, The Self-Driven Child, is this this phrase, which I use. Sorry, I just got, got a little chilly all of a sudden. The AC went on in here um, that you can say uh, and I trust you to make your own decisions and to learn from your mistakes. And I say that verbatim sometimes. Sometimes if it's a safety issue, I'm not going to say that because the mistake might be something that could be, you know, um, injurious to them. Uh, but, uh, but that is a really, it's, it's a way to, to say, yeah, this could go bad and that's okay. And that's how we learn. And that's, I just love that phrasing. The other thing I just wanted to share, and then there's a question, um, very much connected to what you were just talking about. I recently had Tina Payne Bryson on my podcast um, just a few weeks ago. So if you haven't listened to it, she has a new book out with Dan Siegel called The Power of Showing Up. And she talks a lot about secure attachment and how critical that is to our kids' development. And we had a great conversation about it, specifically what our kids need to feel seen and soothed and secure, especially differently wired kids. So check that out at um, Tilt Parenting uh, dot com slash podcast. That's where they all live. And you can listen to that. Um, we have a question about sleep. Can I interrupt before the question? Yes. I love how one thing that Debbie does very well with the modeling, she said it and she kind of brushed by it, but she said it very subtly. When you were talking about going for a walk with Asher and you're saying, um, yeah, it'll help me feel better. I, I feel so much better getting some fresh air. That is modeling. So you're not lecturing. You'll feel so much better getting some fresh air. You're saying I will, but that he, he's hearing that. And, it, you know, so a lot of times I, you're just very good, I think, at weaving in those sorts of, and, and as evidenced by what you just said on this last discussion, but also way back to that one with the walk, just weaving in these little things where we're modeling. Hey, this is how I care for myself. And everything is learning. I think I learned that a, a long time ago that even the worst possible days, the biggest meltdowns, the biggest conflicts that we've had, you know, all of it, I just decided, okay, opportunity, opportunity. you know, and it really, um, so now I think I just look for the opportunity in absolutely everything. And when it, especially if it's something that feels hard or uncomfortable. Have you heard the acronym? I'm in a fog, a freaking <laughs> opportunity to grow. No, <laughs> no, I like that. I like that. All right, let's do this uh, question and then we'll see if uh, we're coming up to the hours. So if you Great. have a burning Great. question, um, 
a shorter question posted in the, the comments here and in the while I'm uh, adjusting this question. This is, I have a question about my 15 year old daughter. She has sleep issues. She has had sleep issues and we, she had to struggle to get her into a good sleep cycle. Now that this is summer, she desperately wants to go to bed late and wake up late, way after 12 noon, as that's how all her friends are, or so she says, LOL. Uh, we keep telling her that it's going to ruin her sleep habits again after all the struggles we had. What are your, your views on this? When she wakes up late, most of the productive day is done. She'll be a junior now and this summer is crucial on building on some college requirements. Great question. Side note, my episode this week is about sleep. So if you haven't listened to it, it's Dr. Roberto Olivardia and we talk about sleep and it was fascinating and he struggles with sleep and I got a lot out of it because that is definitely an issue in our house. Um, couple of thoughts. I mean, what, we know the kids can't make up sleep. That was one of the things that I learned. They can't like sleep in late on weekends and make up for not for staying up late and getting up early. Um, my question is, can your daughter have this sleep schedule, like just pivot everything, right? So going to bed later, sleeping in later, and then as school approaches, start to kind of, you know, uh, edge it back to where it needs to be. Is that is that possible? Because we do know that teens, uh, their clocks change. There's a, you know, a book that I really like by um, Dan Pink called When, and he does, oh, oh no, yeah, we talk, it's in that book too, but there's another book just called Why We Sleep or something, um, but we know that teenagers specifically, their rhythms change, and they are, their brains are wired to stay up late and to, to sleep in, which is why so many people are pushing for later start times for high schools and all of those things. So um, it's, it also might be fighting, like trying to row upstream to, to, to go against that kind of more natural circadian rhythm that a teenager is wired to, to, to move through. So if your child can go through, can, can, get done what needs to be done for, you know, you're talking about college requirements and some things that she either wants to, or you want her to accomplish this summer. Um, if those things can happen just later, is that okay? I wouldn't be so concerned about developing the early morning habits, you know, it, it, this kind of schedule. My inclination would be to make sure that within the time your daughter's awake, she's able to get done what she wants to get done and know that, that, as school approaches, we're going to kind of start to, to uh, work our way back and to get into better sleep habits. I recognize that you've been through a lot to get to a healthy sleep habit uh, phase right now. So I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, but I think there's also something about, like I said, swimming upstream right now. And this may be a time to, to let her kind of have more of the, the, the schedule that her body naturally wants to have. What are your thoughts, Seth? So many. I deal with this <laughs> with a, a lot of students. So I am um, listening to the book, Why We Sleep Right Now. It's a very long book. It'll put you to sleep. It's really <laughs> fascinating. It's so good. Yeah. One of the things that it says about the teenage brain is it says, imagine that your teenager, I forget what it says, but let's say that your teenager wants to go to bed at 2 a.m. and you're telling them to go to bed at 11. It says, imagine somebody telling you, the parent who goes to bed at 10 p.m., that you now have to go to bed at 7, yeah. that their melatonin is being released at a different time. And there is ton and has been tons of research. We've known this forever with teenagers um, that they are going to school so early. They are, their bodies are different. The brain changes. So the, that great book plug, that's a fantastic one. Um, I noticed when you read the question, Debbie, that one of the things in the phrasing of the question was we keep telling her. And that's where I'm talking about where we try to use reason and logic and help them see the light and lecture them. And it often is not sinking. If you keep telling her that and it's not changing anything, then the discussion, the logic, the being rational is not going to change it. So what do you need? Buying an ownership. Is it easy? No, I'm not going to pretend it is. But um, 
I will also say that in, I have struggled with sleep for many, many, many years. I am in a pretty good place right now. And, um, but I have done so much research and stuff like that. I've gone through sleep studies and all this stuff. And I will say that I do think it is worthwhile. I talk about a sacred study space while also a sacred sleep space. I do think it is worthwhile taking very seriously the, let's say that if you got awesome sleep, that that was a hundred points. If you got no sleep, that's zero points. Or if you got horrible sleep, that's 22 points or whatever. Let's say you could weigh it out. Anything that I could do to increase my sleep one point, I did. Uh, so I literally blackened my windows at night. I literally have cut out cardboard and I put them in each window uh, in my bedroom each night. Um, I have what's called a brown noise machine. I do it through my device. You can say play brown noise and it'll do it. Um, I, I have just yada, yada, yada. The point is the sleep environment. There's research on this. You can do that on your own, but um, looking at the research that's been done on the sleep environment and really doing everything you can to sort of notch it up a point for higher quality sleep with your kiddo, with getting by and helping them make the environment as conducive to sleep as possible. Again, I remove electronics completely off for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't even want them in the bedroom. It's just, it's, it, I know it interferes. And so just thinking about those things, getting some buy-in, setting up some structures so that when she does sleep, she gets the best sleep that she can. I very much agree with Debbie. At this time, if she, if she is not staying up on devices until again, three o'clock in the morning, uh, but when her body is tired and she starts getting away from blue light when at a reasonable time, turning off devices and her body starts getting tired, if that happens at 12 or one or two, this is the time to let her do that. Mm -hmm. But what Debbie said is really important. She's going to have a big challenge going back to school. So you want to anticipate that now. And the thing that I thought of for that is that she has to, again, have buy-in and ownership, but you guys can create a plan. I recently quit caffeine. I've quit caffeine before. I gave myself an entire month to quit caffeine. The first week I drank whatever I want. Second week I had one measured cup of coffee that I pre-made. The third week, I had a half of that cup. The fourth week, I had a quarter of that cup. The fifth week, I was done. So, but I use a big, giant $5 wall calendar. I do, I track my fitness on it, my caffeine, whatever I'm tracking. I always do weird little self development things like that. But to have her think through, well, okay. And I would not wait till the last minute. I would be like, all right, if you want some freedom to sleep when you want, when are we going to start doing this? You know, when does school start back up? How can we really back it up 10 minutes a night, 15 minutes a night, 20 minutes? Like how, and I wouldn't worry about it being perfect, but I, what a great experience to have her start to achieve a long-term goal, especially mm -hmm. if she struggles with the executive function, be a part of it. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work or not, um, but trying, getting some progress, like there's so much to reward in that sort of a process that you can really turn into a good thing. But I would say her body would probably, her mood, everything. If she could get some real sleep and listen to her body for a while, oh, mm -hmm. that could have a lot of um, benefits uh, in the next several weeks. I love that you mentioned long-term goal because I wrote that down as you were talking. And, you know, and I'm going to say this also as the parent of a 15-year-old, um, you know, we, who stays up till 1231 reading, um, you know, I used to like every night when I'd say good night, I'd say, don't stay up too late. And then I finally was like, whatever, you're going to do what you want to do. Cause I can't control him. I can't, like, he's going to get to sleep when he gets to sleep. Um, and I think part of this too, is thinking about the long-term goal. Ultimately our kids are going to be in, you know, grown up, they're going to have to understand what they need, what feels good for them, how they can help themselves sleep. Seth shared how he helps himself. Um, you know, my son does, he will read for hours and hours. And sometimes now he asked me to take like his good pillow out of his room because then he can't sit up comfortably and read. That was all his idea. So we want our kids to know what it feels like to not get enough sleep. We want them to know, you know, to really get to know themselves. And summer's the perfect time to experiment and, and become more curious about who we are and what we need and kind of learn those kinds of things too. So because we, again, the long-term goal is for them to 
be able to do this on their own, for them to take care of themselves on their own, get the sleep that they need on their own and understand how, how to do that. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and you do have to ask, is it because of chocolate, caffeine, sugar? Mm -hmm. uh, is it because of anxiety, stress, mm -hmm. depression? Mm -hmm. There are other things that Debbie and I didn't even touch on that you do that are very valid that you want to consider. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so we're at an hour. Um, there are no new questions in here. There's been some really lovely conversation and sharing of resources. So I bet that will continue uh, if people are fine. There's someone looking for a good workout video for that. that's for kids online. Um, that's oh. how I crowdsource my workout video. And I actually, I did a workout today. I think that you had that's right. suggested for me. Um, but, you know, it, I actually just started a thread on the Still Together page too um, for things that you're concerned about either for summer or moving into the fall. Um, that, all, that seems both far away and like it's very present right now because there's so much news coming up about what school might look like and is it going to reopen and, and those kinds of things. So if you have additional things that you're thinking about, please share them on that thread. I think there's a lot of conversation happening you already. You want to know what your concerns are. What are your fears about what's coming up? What are you like? How the heck are they going to do this? What are those questions? Let us know. Yeah. So Seth, uh, thank you for can for I coming. can I talk about that? Bring it on. Okay, I'm I'll be quick, and I'm not going to rant, although I could. Um, but the thing that I know for fall is that we don't know what's going to happen. It's very uncertain. So what Seth's brain does is I say, well, what's the worst case scenario? And the worst case scenario is that we don't go back to school, that we're doing at home learning and that it's a mess and that it's different everywhere. There's no consistency. Different teachers do it different ways. And the worst case scenario is that you go through many weeks of this and you're sitting there going, okay, my kid is doing generally what they're supposed to be doing. We're having homework battles and blah, blah, blah. And they're generally doing something, but I don't feel like my kid is getting an education. That is Seth's biggest concern. So um, what I want to leave you with is knowing that um, education does not have to take place in school. Um, if you research the term enrichment and gifted, you can see how they have a take on what's called enrichment, but enrichment activities are activities that um, all sorts of activities that you can do to learn valuable things for your life that that may not have anything to do with school enrichment camps. There's also um, we're Debbie and I both know Blake Bowles, who just wrote a book called Why Are You Still Sending Your Kids to School? Mm -hmm. And he talks a lot about the unschooling movement. They do a lot of experiential type learning. The point is, is that reading a book, uh, learning things on videos, do, learning songs on guitar, learning instruments, there's so many ways to learn so many things. My concern is that uh, our kids are jumping through hoops in the fall and are having rich, engaging, meaningful learning experiences that are putting pennies in the piggy bank of their future. So that's my biggest concern. So I just want to really encourage you, listen to your gut. It doesn't have to be rocket science. What Debbie said, what I mentioned earlier, sometimes less is more. Um, but to, for I really want your kids to just be having uh, meaningful, engaging learning experiences. They can be small, um, but it doesn't have to look like traditional school. Um, trust your gut. Learning happens in so many ways. I just want them doing things that are challenging them, helping them grow, that are interesting to them, that they're curious about. Um, and it, it, just think outside the box. There's so many ways to do it. I just want to really encourage you. You've got this. Your gut knows. Um, so follow that. Thank you, Seth. Before we say goodbye, someone posted about a great live dance class with Ryan Heffington on Instagram. Uh, lots of parents are doing it with their kids. And that comes from Sarah Wiener, who says hello from Bend, oh. Oregon. Hi, <laughs> she told me to say hello to you. Um, <laughs> Hi, there's Sarah. one last question, which I'm not going to answer here, but I will get back to you in the comments. And it's about the differently wired sibling dynamic over the summer. Um, there, there are a couple of resources that I can't put my finger on in my brain right now because it's 
seven o'clock on a Friday after a very long <laughs> week. Um, but I will follow up in the chat and I'll reply, uh, Christine, to your comments because I know that that's a very, um, I know that's a real issue for a lot of parents is keeping the peace at home right now, especially. So thank you everyone for spending some time with us on a Friday. I hope that uh, you have a good weekend. I just also feel like I need to spend a moment to just say that I know so many of our hearts are very heavy right now. It's been a hard week. It's been a painful day. Um, I know many of us are feeling very distracted and, and frustrated and helpless. So I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that. And um, yeah, just for people in our community who are especially hurting right now, just sending love to you all and um, Tilt, you know, and, and Seth and I, you know, we're very, this is something we talk about uh, in our personal lives very much too. And we're very much um, aware of what's happening and, and want to use our communities as well for, for positivity and for good and for bringing awareness to issues that need to be um, discussed. So anyway, I just didn't want to let the event go without acknowledging what a hard um, day it's been and week it's been, especially for friends in the Black community. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, we, Debbie and I do what we do because we want kids to grow up and have fantastic lives. And part of that hopefully is living in a peaceful, healthy, happy connected sane world yeah thank you for saying that yeah so um thanks again everyone who spent time with us tonight and um it's been really nice and i love engaging with all of you seth thank you for your time and um we'll see you again soon everybody thank you oh if you want my site is sethperler.com uh i send something out every sunday if you want to join my community and start getting um, the work that I put out to the world. And then you can go down the rabbit hole from there. And then Debbie has an amazing podcast, the Tilt Podcast, my favorite parenting podcast by far, and um, has a book, uh, Differently Wired, and all the things on her site. Is your site um, tiltparenting.com? Yeah, Tilt Parenting. I'll put links also in the comments here. Thanks for, um, for mentioning that. And you can go down quite a rabbit hole with Seth's site, which is just recently redone and it's beautiful. So go check it out. Thank you all for spending time with us. Yeah. Bye everybody.